Many thanks for joining us tonight. Um, this is a public talk of, organized by the Department of Mathematics at LSE. I'm the current head of the department. My name is Bernhard von Stengel. Um, I'm also working in the field that our speaker is uh, from, the game theory, mathematical game theory. And we're very, very happy to have Michael Feldmann from Tel Aviv University, who is a, a great colleague who I've known for a long time and a formidable scholar. Um, Michal got her PhD from the University of Berkeley when they started a program there where you could combine computer science and economics, which is a little bit what, I mean, game theory is now settled at. I mean, for instance, design of auctions and so on. And um, so that started in a, a field that has been blossoming ever since for 25 years now uh, called algorithmic game theory. And um, so, um, Michal got her PhD there, then uh, did her postdoc at the Hebrew University, and has an enormous uh, number of accolades. I mean, I know her as a colleague on, on an editorial board of a, a prestigious journal, but she's on five other boards. Um, she got two ERC grants, which are major, very hard to get grants, um, with a lot of prestige and money. Uh, and Marie um, Fellowship, E, 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 in trans traditional fellowship, also something very prestigious. And she's really a role model in all respects. I mean, she also has five children, which I think yeah. you should, I mean, I mean, take account. And four daughters, she's very proud of one boy. And um, so doing all that is really, really impressive. And um, she will talk today about one of her specialties and trying to convey it. I would assume if she does it very well, I know she gives excellent talks about the um, combination of, um, well, game theory, which is about incentives and, and economic decisions, and then also the computational aspects, namely the, the possibility of computing and, and solving these, uh, these problems. So we very much look forward to this. If you are joining us online, I don't have any uh, view of who, how many are online, but we will have after the talk, which will be about an hour, uh, a question and answer session until 8 o'clock and then we also get um, questions from the audience. So if you're online, remember your questions, you might be able to post them and then we possibly answer them depending on time and, uh, and so on afterwards. So Michal, the floor is yours. We look forward to your talk and I hope it will pop up um, on the screen at some time. Do we need to do anything here? I see, so that's it. Oh, great. Cool, there you go. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's also very nice to see all the familiar faces of many people here. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to be here um, in London and in LSC in particular. So, um, great opportunity. And today I'm going to talk to you about approximation. And uh, the title I gave to this talk is that approximation is the new optimal, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So let's start with some background of, of my field, which uh, Bernard also talked about, which is economics and computation. So in the, <coughs> in the end of the previous century, um, something very amazing happened, which is the internet. And with the emergence of the internet, many new applications and markets started to influence our life very deeply. So essentially the internet has become a computational platform for increasingly complex markets and applications, including uh, markets for lodging and rides and cloud computing and AdWord auctions and social networks and online commerce. And all these applications, and in a world where the internet uh, governs our life, algorithms, in a sense, shape society. And they shape many things. They shape the resources we get, they shape the content we see, they shape whom we hire, how we hire, how much we pay them, the opportunities we face. And everything is happening on, these, on this computational platform. And as a result, something very interesting happened uh, which is that computer science, economics, and game theory 
which until then evolved along completely disjoint paths, started to, to interconnect very deeply. Um, and this exchange of ideas flow in both directions. So both computer science, as computer scientists, we needed the reasoning and the modeling of economics and game theory, and <clears throat> economics needed the toolbox of computer science. So computer science traditionally thought of users as, e as either being obedient, namely people that just obey the protocol, we write the protocol, we don't need to, to worry about what the users will do, they'll just follow the protocol. Or the other extreme, which is that users are adversarial. They do everything they can to harm your protocol. And these were the two behavioral models computer scientists had until the, the, the internet came. But then when the internet came up with all the very complex applications and uh, markets, there was a third behavioral model, which, which makes a lot of sense, which is strategic users. They don't want to harm you, and they don't want to, to obey you. They just want to maximize their own utility, their own welfare. And game theory and economics are exactly the disciplines that give us the language, the approaches, the, the tools to handle such users. And from the other directions, when huge markets run on a computational platform like the internet, economics can no longer ignore everything that has to do with computation, computation complexity, algorithms, communication complexity. So suddenly this exchange of ideas started to flow in both directions and a new research area emerged. Sometimes it's called algorithmic game theory or economics and computation. It doesn't matter how we call it, but it's this combined uh, looking at incentives and algorithms in a unified way. And in today's talk, I would like to touch upon a very significant distinction between the way economists and computer scientists view the world. Economists have traditionally emphasized exact optimal solutions, whereas computer scientists view the world through the lens of approximation. So in a sense, we can think about computer scientists as compromisers. Computer scientists are compromisers. They look at the world through the lens of approximation, um, and why is this? So before, before telling you why this is so, let's, I, I'll give you like a glimpse into what the approximation formalism is all about. So usually when we talk about approximation, we have an objective function, f, that we want to maximize or minimize. Um, thank you. Um, the important thing is that it has some cardinal meaning. And the approximation ratio looks at the ratio between the value of f in a constrained world, be it different types of constraints, and the value of f in a perfect unconstrained world. And CS, CS has a long tradition of approximation corresponding to different types of constraints. It all started in the 70s. Uh, when Kukarp and Levin came up with the theory of NP-hardness to categorize problems as being hard or easy to compute. And then they realized that there are these problems that we all care about, like scheduling or packing, problems we, we have to deal with in our daily life that are just hard to compute. And being hard means that they are very slow. So, we must, if we want to solve them optimally, we just can't, probably we can't. I mean, this is one of the big problems of computer science, if you've heard of it, the P versus NP, but I'm not going to get into it. But if it is very hard to compute and it takes forever to run, so let's compensate. Let's go to an approximated solution. We don't have to get 100% of what we need. We prefer to run fast and get maybe 90% of what we get. And this is, uh, and then the approximation ratio measures the loss due to computational constraints. And then in the 80s, 10 years later more or less, um, came another sort of constraint, which is we started to analyze 
online algorithms. Online algorithms are algorithms that don't get all the input together. Rather, they get the input piece by piece without knowing what's going to happen in the future. And the algorithm needs to make decisions now. We call it in an online manner without knowing the future. And then we came up with the notion of a competitive ratio, which is just an approximation rate. It's another name for an approximation ratio for another type of constraint. And the type of constraint is informational. And then the approximation ratio here measures the ratio between the value of f obtained in an online algorithm, the one that needs to make decisions online, and the optimal value of f. And remember this competitive ratio, we'll get to it later. And then in the 90s, when computer scientists started to analyze markets and games and deal with strategic users, we came up with the notion of price of anarchy, which is again just an approximation ratio, another approximation ratio, which now measures the ratio between the value of f obtained in some sort of equilibrium, namely when users act strategically, we can't tell them what to do, they act strategically to maximize their own benefit, and a socially optimum value of f in, in a unrealistic world where we can tell the players what to do. So these are, in a sense, three generations of approximation. And they, all, they come, as you see, they come in different flavor, but the point is that computer scientists are really tuned to think through an approximation lens in different ways. And all of these theories bring up beautiful models and results. Um, but I want to make now uh, an, a very important point. Because an approximation ratio is, is quantitative in nature, sometimes we are really tempted to solve it to the very last uh, decimal digit, maybe the six digit decimal digit, but what I want to tell you here is that it's not the point. It's not the point to get down from whatever number is here to, to, like, to, to, uh, to this number. The point in this talk is going to be that the, the approximation results, while they are quantitative in nature, they mainly provide qualitative insights about problems we care about. And the first point that I want to make today, and I'll do it through the application of auction design, auction theory, is that the approximation, the role of the approximation lens in revealing structure that may remain completely concealed if we look at the world through the lens of optimization alone, if we don't allow ourselves to think about approximated solutions. Okay, so let's, uh, the first application will be auction theory. Auction theory, if you haven't met it yet, it's all around us. Keyword auctions are on, keyword auctions are auctions. Um, we have eBay auctions. We have online advertisements that, that constitute the major component of, business, of the business model of, of, of many of, of the internet companies. We have auctions for wireless bandwidth. Many governments, including the UK, sell uh, radio spectrum to mobile operators through auctions. Uh, of course, we have art auctions, we have government procurement auctions, so auctions are all around us. In order to understand auction theory just a little bit, let's think about the simplest scenario we can think about, which is the sale of a single item. So suppose we want to sell this uh, piece here, and we have uh, two players, uh, two potential buyers, Alice and Bob. Um, they have their own value for the piece. So maybe Alice has a value of $20, and maybe Bob has a value of $5. Um, so this is the model. We have got one good for sale. We have N bidders here, just two, with value V1 to Vn. And the goal is to allocate the good to the bidder with the highest value. And I don't care now about revenue. I don't want to maximize my revenue as a seller. I just really want this piece to be at the house of the person who values it more. That's how much I value art. I don't care about my revenue. The problem is I have no idea 
how much Alice or Bob value this piece. I mean, this is, this, these values are in their heads. I can't read their heads. But I really want to give it to the person who values it the most. So the question is, can we design an auction? And by designing an auction, I'll soon show you what I mean by designing an auction in a way that incentivizes bidders to tell me their true value. And when I say incentivize them to tell me their true value, I mean that it's absolutely in their best interest to exactly reveal their value to me. Okay? They can't make more money, more utility, by lying, by telling me a different value than their real value. Okay, so before answering the, this question, let me tell you what an auction is. So one way to, to model an auction is the following. So we have the bidders, we have the, 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 like, Alice and Bob. They have their own values, the agent values, which is in their heads. I, me, as the auction designer, I don't know their values. But they submit bids. You can think of it as submitting bids in sealed envelopes to me. So this is the auction. The auction gets the bids. And the power of the auction is in determining two types of rules. The first type of rule is an allocation rule, which says who gets the item. OK, so the auction sees all the envelopes. It gets en en envelopes with bids. And it says, based on these bids, who gets, who is the winner? And the second, how much the winner pays. OK, so allocation rule and payment rule. And remember, the only thing I care about, I, I as the seller, is to give the item to the agent with the highest value. OK, so in order to talk about incentives, we, ha we have to define the player's utilities. So the winner's utility, if I win the item, then my utility is the difference between my value for the item and the payment that I make. So if, for example, I'm Alice, I value the painting at $20, and let's say I get it for $10, then my utility is 10. 20 minus 10, this is my utility. Uh, good, so let's try to design an auction that incentivizes agents to tell me their true value. So the first attempt is give it for free. I told you I don't care about my revenue. I only care about giving it to the person who values it the most, so let's just give it for free. So the allocation rule is highest bidder wins, and the payment is free, no one pays. What's the problem? The problem is that agents will overbid. If they don't have to pay, why should they tell the truth? If I value it at 20, but I'm afraid that someone will pay 100, I'll say 101, and I'll win the item for free. So that's definitely not a way to incentivize agents to tell me the truth. OK, so I definitely need to use money. Um, so a natural solution, and this is attempt two, is to do something that is called first price auction, which still gives the item to the highest bidder. But this time, I want to prevent the bidder from overbidding, so I'll charge the bid that the winner tells me. OK? But now, there is the opposite problem, which is that agents will underbid. So if my value is 20, and I know that I'll pay 20 if I win, then the best thing that can happen to me is that I get utility of zero, 20 minus 20. So maybe I'll try to think, OK, my value is 20, but I don't think other people value it as much. Maybe they value it at 15. So I'll say 16, and then I'll be able to make some money. So people will start underbidding. So this is not a way to incentivize agents to tell me the truth. OK. So here is a third attempt. And this attempt, uh, a guy called Vikri, who also won a Nobel Prize, came up with. And this is called second price auction. It's almost the same as first price auction with a tiny change. And the tiny change is that the payment that the winner uh, pays is not the highest bid, but the second highest bid. Okay? So if I get bids of 80, 20, 10, the guy who bids 80 wins the item, but he pays 20. Okay? And the amazing theorem, and this is a mathematical theorem that has a proof, 
and this is victory in the beginning of the 60s, is that this auction, which is called second price auction, is truthful. Okay, and I want you to take a moment to appreciate this theorem because in a, in a sense, I think, um, okay, I'm going to say something very strong, but in a sense, all auction theory is a footnote to this theorem. <laughs> um, this is amazing, okay? This is a very, very simple way to design an auction, and it's, it works like a miracle. And in fact, it's so simple that I can even prove to you that it is truthful. So again, what do I mean by truthful? It means that no agent can benefit by bidding something that is not his true value. Okay, so let's just, let me prove it to you by simulation. Let's think about, let's go back to Alice and Bob for a second. So Alice has value 20 and Bob has value five. Let's see what happens if they tell the truth. If they tell the truth, who is the winner? Alice. Alice is the winner because she is the highest bidder. How much she pays? She pays five, the second highest bid. What's her utility? 20 minus 5, 15, okay? What's the utility of Bob? Zero. He doesn't win the item, he doesn't pay anything, so his value, his utility is zero. Let's try to think if any of them can benefit by cheating. So Ali says, hmm, I win the item and I pay five, maybe I can do better. But then, look at this. As long as I say more than five, I still win the item and I still pay five. So nothing happens to my utility. I say six, I say 20, I say 20,000. It doesn't matter, my utility is always 15. The only way for Alice to change her utility is to say something lower than five. But then her utility is zero, okay? So the winner cannot benefit by lying. Okay, but maybe the loser can benefit by lying. So let's think, then, now let's put the hats, the hat of uh, Bob. So Bob is currently losing and has a utility of zero, okay? He wants to cheat, he wants to win the item. Okay, so maybe he can say 10. No, 10 is not enough because he's still not the winner. As long as he says something that is lower than 20, nothing happens to his utility, he cannot benefit. The only way for Bob to win the item is to say something higher than 20. But then what happens? He wins the item and how much does he pay? 20, because now the second highest bid is 20, which is higher than his value, so he gets negative utility. So the winner cannot benefit by lying, the loser cannot benefit by lying, and here we go, we get a truthful auction, and this is amazing. So it's like reading, I mean, think about it. Let's say I want to, to sell my, to give my cell phone to the person in this room that values the cell phone the most. And there are, I don't know how many of you, I, had, I know nothing about you. I don't know if you have cell phones at all. Probably you do, but I don't know what kind. I don't know how many. I don't know if you need it for your son or daughter or, I, don't, I know nothing about you or how much you value cell phones. And I have a miracle way to make you reveal your true value to me just by running a second price auction. And by the way, the, the most amazing thing about this is that it generalized this theory, and I'm not going to get into it because it gets more complicated mathematically, but this theory generalizes way beyond a single item. So take any huge market with heterogeneous items and heterogeneous agents with very diverse preferences and let's say they, they have values over bundles of items, I have a way to maximize the sum of values in society by designing an auction that incentivizes each person to tell me their absolutely true value for every bundle of, of items in the market. So this is really beautiful, beautiful theory. Okay, so I hope you buy the second price auction is truthful. So now that we all agree, Let's say I want to sell you this doodle. And 
I, I do it, of course, by this beautiful second price auction, because why not? I mean, I just told you how amazing it is. So how many people in this room are willing, would pay uh, five pounds or more for this doodle? The original? <laughs> okay, a hundred or more? A hundred thousand or more? Okay, it gets more and more interesting. And, uh, and how about now? <laughs> and what's the point here? And by the way, I think Picasso was one of the first approximators. <laughs> and uh, a fun fact about, about these doodles that he painted, he painted many of them, is that he did them all with a single brush stroke. And, and there are many of them. This, this is just a sample. Actually, there is a nice story I'll tell you about. Um, so there is a very uh, uh, nice story about Picasso sitting in a French cafe and being asked by the manager if he would mind sketching a doodle for him instead of paying for the meal. So Picasso takes a nearby napkin, sketches a doodle, and hands it to the manager. The manager looks at the doodle and asks Picasso, would you mind signing it for me? So Picasso said, I want to pay the bill, not buy the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the point? The point is that this theory about second price auction is really beautiful, but it makes a really strong assumption. It assumes that people know their own valuation. And in many, many examples in real life settings, I would say in most examples in real life settings, people don't know their valuations. Because my value depends on different pieces of information that you have or someone else has. And they're like, think about auctions for, I mean, we just had this example of art pieces. So some of you recognize Picasso in this doodle, but some of you didn't. So of course, your real value depends on information held by others but also in, in auctions for mining rights, for oil, for mineral, for coal. So different companies run their research to understand the value of, of the land and to try to predict how much oil or coal there is in this land. And different companies have different pieces of information and the value of each company really depends on the value, on the, on the information held by the different parties. And this is also the case in spectrum auction, where the value depends on future technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So almost in every auction that we can think of, people don't really know their value. Um, and this is captured by a very nice model of Milgram and Weber that is called interdependent values. So what is this model? So before, remember, I told you there are n people, and every person has a value vi for the good. Let me return to, to again, to uh, the sale of a single good to, to keep simple. In these interdependent values, every bidder I has a private signal, we denote it by SI. So think about uh, this signal as capturing my private information. I have some private information about the good. And then the valuation of the agent, and let's, let's assume this valuation function is known, it's public. It's a function of, the sig of all signals of all n bidders. Okay, so again, every bidder I has a signal SI that captures some private information that bidder has. And also, every bidder has a valuation function VI that depends on all signals. For example, maybe VI is the average value across all signals. Or maybe the value is a weighted average where I put more weight on my own information and less weight on others. But you can think about completely arbitrary valuation functions that depend on the signals of everybody. And the goal is to, again, maximize social welfare, namely to give the item to the bidder who values it the most, who has the highest not signal, but the highest valuation. So this time, the auction asks people to tell the, the auctioneer their signals. And then the auctioneer can compute the values of everyone and give the item to the agent with the highest value. Okay, this is a slightly more complicated model. No? Let's see, let's, now I, I promised you that the approximation <laughs> lens 
gives interesting theory. So let's first look at this scenario through the lens of optimization. This is the lens that economists took for many years, including like everything about interdependent values. And here is what optimization theory has to say about this model of interdependent values. So according to the optimization lens, everything is totally understood. What do we mean? For the sale of a single item, the optimal welfare can be obtained in a truthful mechanism, similarly to the second price auction, if and only if, so this is a precise characterization, the valuation satisfies some property that is called single crossing. No matter what it is mathematically, it's a mathematical condition, it's fairly restrictive, and many scenarios we care about do not sat satisfy this condition, single crossing. But this is an if and only if. This means that without this property of single crossing, nothing can be done. Okay? Moreover, beyond single crossing, absolutely nothing can be done. With single crossing, without single crossing, unless, uh, I don't know, let's call it unless the stars align. Unless something very, very specific happens. Okay. And, okay, so perfectly understood. The only question, we, do we have single crossing or not? We have, great, for single item. We don't have, we can't do anything. But then I want to ask myself, okay, but let's now look at this scenario through the approximation lens. And now I want to define the approximation ratio to be the ratio between the social welfare that can be obtained in a truthful auction and the optimal social welfare, okay? So now, what, what do I mean? Remember, with approximation ratio, there is always something that we don't compromise on. Here it's truthfulness. I mean, because if people are not truthful, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? I mean, okay, I get something, I optimize over what I get, but I get nonsense. I need to be truthful in order to believe that the information that I get from people is real, is true. So I don't compromise on truthfulness, but I'm willing to compromise on the welfare, on the value that I get in society. And the approximation ratio here is exactly, it's capturing the loss due to the need to be truthful, okay? It's the ratio between this. And if this ratio is a small number, it means that we don't lose much from the need to be truthful. So maybe, for example, maybe, I mean, a nice thing for an approximation ratio is to be constant, to not depend on, let's say, the number of users. Because we think about huge auctions, maybe with you know, many, many buyers, we don't want the loss to be a function to grow with the number of agents. But if it's a small constant, then okay, so maybe we get you know half of the welfare and we are truthful, then it's nice. So the question is, is there a truthful auction that obtains good approximation to welfare? And here is a result we were able to obtain, to obtain just by looking at this problem from this approximation lens. If valuation satisfy submodularity over signals, again, I don't want to get into the mathematical definition. The way to think about it is that it captures some decreasing marginal returns over signals. And if you really want to know what it is, it means that if the signals of others are lower, then an increase in my signal has a, has a larger effect. That's, that's what it means. If you're familiar with the notion of submodular set function, then it's a generalization of that, okay? So it's decreasing marginal returns. This is a very natural property, which most of the settings from the literature do satisfy. And what we get is that if valuation satisfy this property, then we can get a constant approximation to welfare in a truthful auction. Okay, so why is it interesting? So first of all, we meet a very natural condition that was completely concealed when we looked at the world through the optimization lens. And this, is, this seems a really fundamental property of the setting. The only way we could understand that this property is, is interesting 
is because we allowed ourselves to move in the grays. And then we found this SOS, submodularity over signal state. And by the way, this is not only for the single item auction, but this generalized even for complex combinatorial auctions. So again, a setting with many items, many, many meters, completely heterogeneous preferences under some slight conditions. Okay, good. And then, um, remember I told you that uh, the signals are private, but the valuations are public? So another challenge is what happens if the valuations are also private. And again, if we go there, the, the setting becomes extremely challenging. And optimization theory says, again, nothing can be done whatsoever. And again, with the approximation lens, we are able to, again, find a, 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 an analysis, a way to build a truthful mechanism with the SOS condition, with the submodularity over signals condition, that gives us constant approximation to welfare, even in this entirely challenging setting. So what's the point here? The point being that the approximation lens is important in revealing structure. It has a very meaningful, crucial role in revealing patterns, structure, that are concealed when we looked at the world through the optimization lens at all. And here we, we found the SOS property, submodularity over signal, as a fundamental structural property that was revealed to us only through the lens of approximation. Yes? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be truthful to report your correct signal? To, to report your correct signals. And the variation function you don't have. Uh, in yeah. the first setting, the valuation was public, so you yeah, don't need to. But, but in the second setting, you also have to report your valuation. And that could be also manipulated. That could be okay, also manipulated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is why it's very challenging. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So this is the first part of the talk uh, about auction theory. And now I would like to to uh, use another example, which is online decision theory, to again show you the richness of the approximation paradigm. So let's start with uh, something that I call the hitchhiking game. Suppose I am in Oakland, and I want to get a ride to Yosemite Park. So the first car uh, comes. And I ask, okay, where, where are you going? And the driver says, I go to Stockton. And I have to decide. So now it's online decision making, no. So the information that I get now is that I have a ride to Stockton. And I have to decide, do I take it? And then I improve my position a bit, but I don't go all the way to the vicinity or not. If I take it, then I know that I'm at Stockton. If I don't take it, I lose it forever. So this is, you know, these push your luck scenarios that we always, I mean, many of us meet them in life. There are all these reality shows that we, that we know that, you know, you can get $10,000 now or lose it forever and go to the next stage. And then you might not get anything or get, say, twice as much, right? But we, we don't know the future and we have to make a decision now. Okay, so this, she, she okay, it's not close enough. Uh, the next car goes to Auckland. No, that's definitely not uh, good. And then the next one to San Jose. Then comes one to Groveland. Okay, Groveland is maybe closer. So she takes it and then she's in Groveland. What she didn't know is that the next car went all the way to Yosemite, but she lost it. Okay, and this is online decision making. And we all do it all the time with job offers, with a ride, with an Airbnb apartment. Do we take now a good one, a good enough one, or do we wait the perfect one uh, to potential buyers? And even with pretty you know, serious decisions like choosing a partner for life. Do I wait to the next one? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> um, OK, so here is a beautiful model that, that really models all of these situations. Um, so think about the following model. You have a sequence of n boxes. Every box in every 
box, you, you know the distribution of the prize inside the box. Every box has a prize inside it. And you know the distribution of the prize within each box. So maybe the first prize um, is uniformly distributed between 20 and 40, and the second prize is uniformly also distributed between 20 and 40, and then between 10 and 50, 0, 70, whatever. Okay. So uh, initially, none of the values are known, only the distributions. And then in every uh, step in the game, uh, in every round of the game, one value is revealed. Let's say here, I reveal to you the real price inside this box is 33. And then you have two options, either to stop, which means you keep the current price, you take the $33 and go home with $33, and then the game ends, or you continue. Then you run the risk of, you don't know what's coming in the future. The $33 are lost forever for you, and you go to the next stage. Okay, so here is, I mean, this is the game, let's play. So who takes the $33 and go home? Okay, so if you raise your hand, you're out of the game. You have $33, and that's it, the game is over for you. Okay, so only one, one person. Next round, 22. Who takes the 22? No one. Okay. Third round, 36. Okay. Okay, I see more and more hands. And there are these brave people who wait to the end. 40. <laughs> okay. Um, but was it smart to wait to the end? The expected val what's the expected value of the last box? It's 35. Okay, so it's some risk. I mean, it happened to be higher, but of course, okay, it's random, random variables. The goal is to maximize your value. That's the, that's the, okay? I mean, you want to marry the perfect guy, right? Um, good, oh, okay, there is some problem here with the animation. So here is the, okay, so now again, let's start with optimization theory. What does optimization theory tell us? There is a, a, an optimal way to solve this game, and this is doing backward induction. Of course, you start with the last box. The last box, whatever box and whatever you are offered, you take it home, right? Otherwise, you get zero. So of course, everything you get, you take. In the one before last box, in box n minus one, you accept it if it exceeds the expected value of the last box. And this decision gives you some expected value if you got up to box n minus one, and then in box n minus two, you accept it if it exceeds the expected value of the remaining boxes and so on and forth, so forth. So this optimal, and this is the optimal strategy to solve this game. And this optimal uh, strategy essentially gives you a sequence of n thresholds, a threshold for every box, and the optimal decision is in, 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 round, in every round, take the prize if it exceeds the threshold. Okay? Good. So this is what optimal theory tells us. But now I want to show you a beautiful approximated result. And this result is sometimes called the profit inequality. And it's from the, the 70s and, and 80s. Um, and here is the theorem. It says that there exists a single threshold. Remember, the previous solution was a sequence of n different thresholds. Maybe you have, you know, 100 boxes. This theorem tells you that there is a single threshold, a single number, 17. And the strategy is to accept the first prize that exceeds this single value. This threshold, this strategy, gives you at least a half of the optimal thing you can get. Still the optimal online? Then. No, that's the thing. Okay. It's the it, great question, so I want you to know. It gives you at least a half of the expected maximal number. And this is why it's called profit inequality. It gives you at least one half of a profit who can see into the future. Not the best online solution, which I showed you in the previous slide. It works against a much stronger benchmark. 
the optimal offline solution. Okay, at least a half of what a profit would get in expectation. Okay, so a few notes about this. First of all, it's completely simple. It's a single number. It's a very, very simple strategy. The second thing that I want you to note, it's certainly suboptimal. Of course it's not optimal. It tells you that even in the last box, if the last offer does not exceed this number, 17 that you computed, you don't take it. So of course it's suboptimal. But it always gives you at least a half of a profit who can see, who can look into the future. And why, why is it an amazing result? Because a profit is really an unrealistic benchmark. I mean, who can, who can see the future? I mean, we are not profits. So it's, it, it can be much better than the optimal online solution that I showed you before. Formally, remember in the beginning of this talk, I told you that there is this approximation ratio that, that measures the loss due to information constraints, and we called it competitive ratio. So this result, the profit inequality theorem, in formal language, it says that the competitive ratio of this online algorithm is one half. It always gives you at least a half of the <laughs> optimal expected reward. Um, okay, now going back to Bernard's question, quite amazingly, this is the best possible competitive ratio. So the best online algorithm gives you exactly the same competitive ratio. You can't beat one half. Okay, so in what sense this is optimal and this is suboptimal? So one thing to note is that when we compute the competitive ratio, we take the worst case ratio over all possible instances. So the fact that the optimal online algorithm and this single threshold algorithm gives you exactly the same competitive ratio, it doesn't mean that for a given instance they give you the same solution. It means that in both cases, the worst case ratio is one half. Okay? Quick question. Yes. Do you allow for random this is for randomization or pure algorithm? Uh, this is deterministic algorithms. This is deterministic algorithm. But even if you allow random algorithms, you cannot do better than one half. Oh. And okay, let me do we have time? Uh, so let me I, I can tell you why. Think let's think about um, a really simple scenario. You have two boxes. One box is always one deterministically. The other box as a huge number with tiny probability. Let's say with probability epsilon, it has one over epsilon. The, the, the value is one over epsilon. So the first box arrived, it has one. Do you take it or not? If you take it, you have one. If you don't take it, you also have one. One over epsilon times epsilon. So you can't get better than, than one, and randomization would not help you here. However, what's the expected maximum value? With probability epsilon, it's one over epsilon. With probability one minus epsilon, it's one. So it's two. So you can't get better than one. No, no, randomization would not help you here. Okay, but now I want, you, I want you to see, okay, so we have the optimal algorithm and we have the, this the approximation algorithm. I want to show you uh, how beautiful this approximation algorithm is, how many benefits uh, uh, it has. So first of all, it's simple. And simple is always good. I mean, we, we want simple algorithms. We want simple solutions. So it's really simple. It's one number that just, I mean, I can describe it to any kid. Uh, you know, my 11-year-old my, my uh, son asks me, do I, do, do I need to accept this offer? And they tell him, as long as it's above 17. Okay, one day he gets 16, he says no. The other day he gets five, he says no. The other day he gets 30, he says yes. Completely simple. The second advantage is that it's order oblivious. The algorithm doesn't need to know the order in which the boxes arrive. Remember, it's a single number. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at all in what order they arrive. The third advantage is that it's identity blind. Not only it doesn't need to know the order, when a value arrives and reveals itself, it doesn't need to know 
from what box it came. And this is very crucial. For example, it has very nice uh, implications for fairness. I mean, there is now uh, a huge trend to try to reduce bias. And reduce it. part of reducing bias is making decisions based on the value. For example, double blind review. You evaluate the paper based on its academic merit, not on the underlying distribution, which is the reputation of the authors, right? Or now uh, there is a trend to perform uh, auditions in orchestras behind a curtain because you want to reduce bias. You don't want to make the decision based on gender or ethnicity. You really want to make a decision based on the value, the merit, not the underlying distribution. And this algorithm is identity blind. I get, I, I get a value. I don't need to know which box it came up with. I mean, you can, in this, in, in, in this uh, example that I showed you, I can be colorblind. I don't need to know. I see 10. I don't need to know if it's 10 pink or 10 uh, orange. Uh, another nice advantage is that it's applicable to real life scenarios. For example, if I think of these boxes with values as potential buyers, with values uh, distributed according to some underlying distribution which represent maybe their population, it means that I can get at least one half of the maximum value by just a posted price algorithm. I just need to post a price and the first buyer whose value is greater than the price will buy it. I get one half of the optimal welfare. And lastly, it's extendable beyond single item, and I don't have time to get into it, but there is huge literature on extending this profit inequality much beyond the sale of a single item. So, for example, uh, maybe we want, we want to do matching, maybe we want to, do, um, to choose multiple items and maximize the sum of values and many other feasibility constraints. And, the, and, and this, I mean, it's not the single threshold, eh, 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 but it's the underlying concept beyond single, be, beyond, uh, single threshold that extends. Okay, so now we get to the end. I think I'm okay with time. Um, okay, good. So um, I hope I was able to convince you that the approximation less of computer science is uh, helpful, also beyond computer science, and it has many nice applications in economics. Um, but uh, on a more personal note, maybe, I can share that I started to adopt this view also in my personal life, um, where I, I started to appreciate the impact of perceiving the world in its nuanced shades and not restricting myself to, to black and white uh, view. And it has many, like in many, many domains in my life. Of course, I won't share everything, but, uh, <laughs> but for example, life-work balance. Uh, I don't want to view it as a binary choice of work or, or life because my career is a very important aspect of my life. It's where I get uh, some of my inspiration and creativity and friends. So it's not uh, a different thing than my life. It's in you know these uh, gray uh, areas. Um, it's also related to the notion, to the theory of uh, Winnicott, the psychoanalyst, if some of you know, of a good enough mother. So by extension, I like to think of a good enough mentor. <laughs> One of my students is here, so, <laughs> so maybe I'm a good enough mentor, um, which is nice. I, I don't need to be the perfect mentor, and maybe it's even better. Maybe, maybe it's more perfect than being a perfect mentor. Um, and finally, um, I want to touch upon um, the role of mathematics in our life. So we can think of two very extreme um, perspectives. One that is maybe best represented by Hardy, who view, who want to value mathematics only, you know, who view mathematics as completely useless. And it's only the sheer beauty and aesthetics of mathematics that should be valued. And there is the completely different extreme, 
which is the only as which says that the only aspects of mathematics that should be values valued are those that can be applied and that are useful for engineers and for, for applied scientists. And uh, rather than sub subscribing to either one of these extreme points, I prefer to, to appreciate the balance of, of the sheer beauty of mathematics with its uh, applicability in many settings. And I feel very fortunate to work in a field that that combines the elegance and beauty of mathematics with its uh, practical applications. So my advice to you is live your, live your life in the grace. And with that, I want to thank you for listening. It takes a while to get the first question, but then I know this. Um, <laughs> it gets going, so don't be shy. <laughs> please, please ask. So there is, I'm serious, it takes a while. <laughs> Anybody? There is a question back there. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've been broadcasting quite a lot on the Ukraine war, so uh, I am rather interested in how algorithms fit in and where they don't fit in, you know, horses for courses and nuances. Um, luckily, I, or unluckily, of course, I, I did predict that there would be an invasion, and, but I'm not sure the factors would apply here. Maybe they would. But my question is, are there any particular real-world examples where the success of the ample examples surprised you and therefore perhaps that reinforces where they work and where they don't. Where the success of the algorithm surprises you? Is that what I understand correctly? Yeah, um, surprised on the upside where you think they, they are extremely useful. They can tell an awful lot. Uh, or indeed the other way around, where they didn't come up with what you might have hoped for. Um, so I think um, I think one uh, place where that at least I was surprised is in auction theory again, where um, the theory told us that greedy algorithms where greedy algorithms are ones that just, uh, at every point in time, just do whatever is best right now without uh, considering more sophisticated uh, considerations. And what we found is that greedy algorithms work really well with incentives. And um, so, okay, what, what do I mean by that? I told you that an auction has to make two decisions. One is allocation rule, and one is payment rule. So the payment rule is the way to make the allocation rule truthful, to make it so that the allocation rule can be, we call it, implemented. And um, some allocation rules simply cannot be implemented, meaning that we can't find a payment rule that would make them truthful. For example, in this single item auction, I told you that the allocation rule is that the highest bidder wins. And what payment rule makes it truthful? If I charge the winner the second highest bid. Great. This means that the highest bidder, the, the, like the allocation rule of giving the item to the highest bidder, is implementable. We have a payment rule that makes it truthful. 
if, for example, we change the rule to be that the second highest bidder wins, there is absolutely no payment that would make it truthful. So that means that this allocation rule is simply unimplementable. Okay? Okay, this is very nice, but this is for the sale of a single item. And of course, with all these huge markets that I told you about in the internet, we don't care about single item auction, we care about huge auctions. So then we need much more sophisticated algorithm. So one thing that we found is that greedy algorithms, which are definitely not optimal, they're usually suboptimal, but they work very well with incentives. So this is something that I find very useful because greedy algorithms are very intuitive and sometimes the miracle works so that the greedy algorithms on the one hand give us good approximation and are also implementable in the sense that we can make them truthful. Question? Yeah, please. Um, first off, thank you very much for this. It was wonderful. Um, I have a question on the example you gave when you were covering approximation of first. So that very, very simple example you gave with the kid, right, where there's a sort of threshold, um, you go through your options, and the first time you, you get, get, get an outcome where it's above that threshold, you pick it and that's it, right? Um, this may be a naive question, but isn't there a realistic possibility where you go through those and none of those are above the threshold that you've initially picked, probabilistically, right? And I understand this is just a reality of approximation, but yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this, if that makes sense. Um, I think I didn't quite get the question. When, let's say you have that threshold, mm -hmm. and you go for your different boxes, different options that you have, right. and each of those, it's a certain number that ends up being between two bounds, right? Let's your bound is 17, like your threshold is 17, all the numbers you get across your options are below, below. the threshold that you picked. Right, so that, so that algorithm tells me don't take anything. Exactly. Yeah. And and that, that's essentially it, right? That's just a part of the approximation piece that you end up with. That's just what the output is. Yeah, so okay, so, so uh, one important point to make is that everything I told you is in expectation. So on average, you get uh, uh, this, like what I told you. And what you say is right. I mean, of course it's suboptimal. I mean, um, in the very extreme case that you got all the way to the last box, you should just take whatever they're offering you. Probably if you are a human, you will do it even before the last box. So if you keep seeing low numbers, maybe at some point you give up. But this is only strengthening the result in the sense that even if you really, you know, you're really religious with this, you don't take anything unless it's above 17, even then you still get at least one half in expectation, which is even strengthening the result. I mean, of course you can take the last box if you didn't get above 17, and then, and then it gives you only more. But even if you don't, you get at least a half. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? <clears throat> thank you for your, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just thinking about the difference between first price, second price auctions, and yeah, absolutely. Second price auctions have a lot of very nice characteristics. Truthfulness is brilliant. Um, but is there not an issue of when this is applied to public life? Suppose they're selling off the spectrum auctions, for example, um, and these bids become public knowledge. Then suddenly the newspapers are going to go, well. You gave it to the person who bid the uh, you know, second. You gave it to the person uh, at a lower price than what, you, what they actually wanted to buy at. So, how can you persuade a politician to to go for a uh, an environment where they're probably going to be slated in in public for going for that type of auction? Yeah, gr yeah. So this is a great question. And um, like many other facts that I hid under the rug uh, for this talk, there are also disadvantages of, of some of the algorithms I showed you, including the second price auction. Um, and one big thing is that you actually reveal your value. So in Spectrum Auction, for example, a company doesn't want to reveal its value because you know it has many implications for the future. And 
Uh, so a few comments about this. So first of all, you are completely right. And, um, but the nice thing is that there are different types of auctions that are mathematically equivalent to second price auction without revealing one's value. For example, instead of doing these sealed bid envelopes with bids where people really uh, reveal their value and then you do second price auction, we can run a, an increasing price auction where I tell you, okay, I sell again this cell phone. Instead of collecting all your bids, I say, okay, who wants to pay $1 for it? And then $2 and then $3, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the last bidder bids and then someone says, I'm willing to pay more, let's say $1 more, essentially, this is precisely second price auction without revealing any unnecessary information beyond the fact that my value is higher than the last bid that happened. So this is mathematically equivalent, but if we look, for example, at this property, then it's completely different, okay? Yeah. By the way, um, so with my students, I, before I start to teach them uh, auction theory, I play with them the following game. So I take a bill of $20, and uh, I run the following auction with them. I tell them, okay, I'm running an auction for a bill of $20, and these are the rules of the auction. So you can start to, to uh, say uh, bids, you can only go up, and the rules are the following. If, uh, for example, Galit says $1, and then everybody is silent, she gets the $20 bill for $1, she wins, and she just pays her offer. Um, but then maybe someone else says $2. And the rule is the following, the highest bidder always wins the bill of $20 and pays what they bid. So for example, if Galit says $1 and Bernard says $2, Bernard gets the bill for $2, but Galit also pays her offer, which is $1, okay? And then I say, who wants to play? And they're all very excited. You know, maybe I played with $100 uh, bill. And they say, yeah, why not? I mean, I can pay $3 for a 100 bill. Okay, let's, let's do the $20. So think about what happens. So Galit says $1, and then Bernard says $2. Now Bernard pays $2 for a bill of $20. Great, he's doing really well. Galit is paying $1 for nothing. So, of course, she'll say $3. Okay, so far not very interesting. Then, of course, Bernard will say $4, and then Galit says $5, and then Bernard says $20. At this point, he's not very happy because, you know, he buys $20 for $20. Great, not very beneficial. But Galit now pays $19 for nothing. So she will now offer me $21 for the $20 bill, because then she will lose only $1 and, and not $19. But then Bernard will offer me 22, and Galit will offer me 23, and who knows when this will end. So usually I go home with a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually reminds me another story from my daughter. So when she was five, I told her, okay, let's go. She, she had a birthday, and I told her, let's go to buy a present, and we went to a mall. And I told her, okay, you choose, uh, you choose what store you want a present for, from. And we, we, there, there was this beautiful toy store, and I told her, I asked her, do you want a present from this store? And she said, no. And then I asked her, do you want from this? She said, no, 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 no. And I told her, okay, so what store do you want to get uh, the present from? And she points there, it's a bank. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her, what do you want to buy from the bank? And she said, I want to buy a, a 200 shekels bill. And I asked her, okay, how much do you think you have to pay to get a 20 hundred shekels bill? And she said, 200 shekels, of course. So I said, okay, so wh wh what do you get from it? And she says, you pay them the 200 shekels. <laughs> <they get it." laughs> she was five. <laughs> They get smarter and smarter. <laughs> Very good. I have two online questions here, so let me ask the first one by Violetta Shehi. 
how does the effectiveness of algorithms change for revenue management systems when items are perishable? So like a flight seat or a hotel room um, that you cannot book after the day is over or the flight has gone. Uh, and the business makes no money, so do we choose the different methods? Do you have something for perishable goods? Um, okay, good. So, so first of all, um, when we talk, so um, like many other things I didn't tell you in this talk, I mainly focused on maximizing what's called social welfare, which is maximizing the value, like the overall value in the world. This is called social welfare. And in the auction settings I told you about, this is just maximizing the sum of values um, in the world. Revenue maximization is quite different than welfare maximization. So even before going to perishable uh, goods, um, just maximizing revenue is completely different than maximizing welfare. Um, it's much more complicated and it has very surprising um, things happening there, sometimes very not intuitive. Um, by the way, approximation theory is extremely useful when it gets to revenue maximization because unlike welfare, where getting optimal is, is easier, with revenue it's much more difficult, and so approximation is, is very interesting. Okay, so this is like one comment just about uh, really uh, maximizing revenue is, is quite different than maximizing welfare. I mean, there are some nice, nice uh, connections between maximizing welfare and maximizing revenue. There is a beautiful uh, theory by Meyerson, for those of you who want to follow up, um, especially in simple scenarios, maximizing revenue is related to, maximize, to my, maximizing welfare, but it's not quite the same. Now about, um, so what are the examples? Um, so like airline seats or hotel rooms that perish after the date has gone. Yeah. Fish, of course, as well, but you might Fish, have it, yeah. Um, um, at a discount. Right. <laughs> so I'm trying to think, I mean, there are, I mean, fish market is a really nice topic and there are beautiful papers about, uh, about fish market. I'm trying to think if I have anything uh, in particular to say about it. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have something in particular to say, except that that of course, usually the way to deal with it is to think about some discount factor um, that as days go by, you have some discount factor because the good is about to go away and then like the mathematical problem becomes different. But I can't think of anything in particular. Maybe, maybe well, for speed, I mean, there's the flower market in, in, in the Netherlands where you have a Dutch auction where you go down mm -hmm. and at some point somebody says, yes, I buy it at that price and then the auction is over. So it's extremely quick. So that at least accounts for a speed. I mean, that's... For a speed. Uh, but that's not the, like, the same question, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess mean, also big... stock market where speed uh, matters. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also it's a game, right? When if airplanes would lower their prices too much, even they would give it away for free, then people might wait until the last minute. And True. Uh, I think airline prices go up once you, I mean, when you fly tomorrow, yeah. it's very expensive. So I, so I think part of the game there is to understand that this is kind of a two-player game where both parties strategize. It's the airline that strategize, but also the user strategize. So just like Bernard said, of course, if I know that the airline is going to reduce prices in the end, then I'll wait until the end. But then the airline, knowing that this is my strategy, might not behave like this because, and this is uh, like a very, very uh, fundamental notion in game theory, which is called an equilibrium, where both parties best respond to each other. And, um, and here I think, yeah, part of the thing is to, uh, to find this uh, equilibrium in this very interesting game. I have another online question here, but if there's something, yeah, then we can interleave, yes? So I'll come back to the other online question, yes? 
Uh, my question is, uh, how do you measure social welfare? Because when you talk about maximizing revenues, uh, it's quite intuitive to me, like, mm -hmm. let's say a company trying to maximize sales, whatever. But social welfare, because it involves many people with, you know, sometimes contradictory interests, right? So how do you measure that? Right. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question was, how do I measure social welfare? So um, an important thing about social welfare is, when I think about social welfare, I think about the total good in the world. Now, payment, I don't really, in the models I showed you, for example, payment mm. just moves from one hand to another, so I don't care about the payment. So maybe, you know, you pay me, uh, $20, it's not part of the welfare because you lose it and I win it. And the whole point of social welfare is that I treat everyone equally and they just sum the value, the total utility in the world. So if, for example, I think of maybe even a very complex market with, uh, let's say, um, a market over many items, heterogeneous items, and many buyers who gain values over bundles of items, which is not necessarily additive, linear, so maybe you know, having a bundle of two goods together uh, is worth more to me than like, if I have a cell phone and headphones, I have some value for the bundle, and if I get just the headphones without, and without the cell phone, maybe it's worth nothing to me. So really I have value over bundles. And now, okay, so maybe you want to sell me, you are the seller in this huge market, and thousands of people come to you with very heterogeneous preferences and valuations over bundles. So then, uh, maximizing welfare means to allocate the goods in a way that maximizes the sum of the values uh, across the entire society. So think about the thousand people that come to your market. Everybody gets some bundle and has some value for the bundle they get. So you sum the values over all these bundles that you allocate to agents, and this is what you want to maximize. You don't care about payment because, you know, I, I pay and you get it, so it's, it's cancelled out. Now, a computational note, when you go to an even not so complicated market, but slightly complicated market, the problem of finding, just finding the allocation that maximizes social welfare is a hard problem. In the language of computer science, it's an NP-hard problem. For example, here is a not so difficult problem. I mean, maybe it seems not so difficult. Uh, consider a market where every buyer has some bundle that she wants. And she gets her, and she has some value for a very particular bundle. So her value is that number, the value she has for this bundle, as long as she gets at least this bundle, and zero otherwise. Okay, and now you have N, 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 B, N, N agents and buyers. Each one has just one bundle that they want, and the value they have for it. Knowing how to allocate the goods uh, to these buyers in a way that maximizes social welfare is an NP-hard problem. So even there, and, and now let me make another point, and this is where the approximation paradigm becomes really interesting. Because even without considering truthfulness at all, just the algorithmic problem, you want to allocate the goods to maximize social welfare is already a hard problem. And What's our approach as computer scientists when we uh, handle a hard problem? We go to an approximation algorithm, okay? Now, suppose you want to address both the computational problem, but also the strategic problem, okay? So in some sense you have to, in both cases you might need to go to approximation. And the question is, does your solution degrade even more if you want to simultaneously handle both the computational problem and the strategic problem? In some cases you do, in some cases you don't. And this is a very, a very fundamental problem in, in a field called like algorithmic mechanism design, which is how to, how to build mechanisms that make people uh, act strategically good. 
since you, there's a, it fits to what you said. I mean, so the question is, how does the algorithm apply to real life auctions when we have multiple bidders and multiple goods? I'm sure you have something to say to that because you gave examples with single items and so on. But the question is, do we have a theory for multiple bidders, multiple goods? Okay, so the, the, the most beautiful theory about uh, multiple items, multiple goods is, uh, and I hinted on it in my talk, is a generalization of second price auction. And it's called, usually we call it VCG mechanism, or it stands for Vickery, Clarks, and Groves. Uh, three great uh, economists, researchers, um, that came up with a beautiful generalization of second price auction. And the, the, the theory is completely general in the following sense. So again, let's go to the market I described to you. There are, in fact, it goes way beyond. Uh, let's, okay, let's think about an even more general uh, scenario. You have a set of outcomes uh, I mean, think about abstract outcomes. Anything can be an outcome. And people have, many people, have different values for different outcomes. Okay? And you want to find the outcome that maximizes the sum of values of all the agents in your, in your setting to the chosen outcome. Okay? And this is, again, maximizing social welfare. Okay, so this is a completely general setting. It's like, it's a, it's a general social choice. It's part of social choice theory. So again, you have a set of outcomes, a set of agents. Every agent has some value for every outcome. And you want to choose the outcome that maximizes the social welfare, namely the sum of the values of the agents to the chosen outcome. The theorem says there is always a way to find a truthful mechanism that maximizes the social welfare. So there is always a way to charge people the right amount of money that incentivizes them to reveal their values truthfully. And uh, maybe another small fact about it, because I'm not, uh, you know, I can't hope to tell you the whole theory here. But just one nice fact about it is that the way to do it is to charge every person their externality on the society. So if you charge every person exactly the externality, how much they hurt other people by, by just being, uh, you get a truthful mechanism. Oh. Sounds a bit negative, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I want to claim it's positive, actually. Okay. Um, because, I mean, think, for example, about application of pollution. Okay. When you are a firm, and every firm has some pollution, some unavoidable pollution, and you want to reduce pollution in the world, then the theory tells you you have to charge every firm the externality on society. So if they pay what they, what they uh, you know, how much they degrade the welfare in the world, then you get a good uh, mechanism, which makes sense. But what is the truthfulness in that scenario? Do you not lying about your, your pollution or, I mean, or does it make sense? Yeah, okay, so we have to get into the model, but, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. but you know, even, even, I mean, think even about uh, second price auction. Mm -hmm which is a special case of, it's exactly a special case of this, because if you are the winner, so second price auction tells you, you pay the second highest bid. What's your externality on the world, on society without you? It's precisely how much welfare did you steal from the world by the mere fact that you exist and you are the highest bidder? It's the second highest value. Because if you were not part of the world, then this was the welfare in society. Now that you are part of society, the, the rest of the society gets zero welfare. So this is precisely your externality on the society, the second highest bid. And this is a special case of the general rule that I told you, that everybody pays their externality on society. I have myself a question, and I don't want to be the, the last one, so I'm asking it now. Um, Google had this, price, this kind of second price auction that stabilizes their revenue because 
so in, in Google, when you have this keyword that you add, I mean, there is a, the, when you click on an advertisement, the company has to pay. This is the ad auction. And this is a dynamically priced according to an auction mechanism. And I understand they originally had some sort of, I mean, I know it's not second price, but it's this. Anyhow, the idea was because you don't directly influence your price, it, it oscillates less, and that's why you have a kind of second price auction. Mm -hmm. But allegedly, they're now switching to first price. Do you know anything about it? Uh, and you're not uh, working for Google, I think. I'm so. not working for Google. <laughs> yeah. and but, uh, another disclaimer, I work for Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But would you know why they're doing this? Uh, if the rumor is true, I mean, I know we have a colleague who works for Google, and he cannot tell me. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I actually heard uh, I heard the same thing. I don't know any information about it. Um, yeah, I don't know if you referred to the. So originally, so okay. So let me just give you a little bit of background on Google ad auctions. So usually, when you when you enter any any search on Google, let's say you write a vacation New York, then you get uh, two types of results. One is what's called the organic results, which, which goes through the organic algorithm of Google. And the second set is the sponsored search results. And these are auctions that run in real time. So when you hit enter, many companies that want to sell you their goods, um, uh, the good for sale, the good for sale is your eyes, okay? And Google sells these companies your eyes, and then the way it goes, so everybody, you know, uh, bids on, on, on some keywords, let's say Vacation New York, and the way Google used to have it is the, like a generalized second price, which is you rank the bids by order, so maybe, you know, 10, 8, etc., and you put them in that order, and every bidder pays the next highest, the next higher bid. So this is, okay, one important thing to say, this is not a truthful auction. This is a generalization of second price auction, but a wrong generalization of second price auction if the idea was to be truthful. So this is not a truthful auction. Uh, sometimes we call it generalized second price, and this is indeed what Google used to mm -hmm. do, and then they switched. Um, That's what I heard. Yeah, I, I think it's true. Uh, I, I don't have any details about it. But, I, but the, the fun thing about it, I think, is that... Okay, so one thing that I'm really curious to know is why they originally came up with this generalized second price auction. Um, Didn't Helvarian invent it, your, your <laughs> supervisor? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I don't know if Helvarian was there in the Maybe no, he I was. think he, uh, he got a prize from the Game Theory Society for this thing. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So maybe I maybe I won't comment. No, actually, on it anymore. yeah. Well, well, anyhow, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was then the other uh, Edelman and then some others. You know. Yeah. Okay. Right. So and there was then, then, there, there then were two, two papers. Yeah. yeah. yeah Halvarian and then uh, Michael Ostrowski. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. Yeah. Ostrowski, Edelman, and somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. So there are nice properties of okay. this auction. Mm -hmm. However, it's not. Yeah, but it's uh, relatively stable. In equilibrium, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, they, uh, what they showed, I think, is that in equilibrium, it has some nice uh, mm -hmm. properties. Okay, so you don't know exactly. About I don't it, know. No, I don't. Uh, maybe know there was. Any yeah, there must. I mean, I'm uh, sure they wouldn't do it unless they make money from this. So I'm, I mean, we, mm -hmm. I always say the game theorists that work for Google and design these auctions, they are worth their money. So studying game theory, I mean, has its I'm not sure societal benefit, but certainly monetary benefits. Okay. Um, Long story. We have one more question. Time for one more question. Back there, please. Thank you. Uh, brilliant presentation and brilliant results. Uh, uh, I uh, find myself being increasingly skeptical of mechanism design, uh, especially its interaction with human beings. Um, uh, not, not an attack on your career, but um, let, let's say we talk about trusts, right? About what? Trusts. Trusts. Um, if everyone is unboundedly rational, right, we do not need trusts. I can solve the model myself and realize truthful telling is in my best interest. I'll tell my information to you willingly. That's fine. That's fine. But we are not unboundedly rational, right? Uh, being truthful to Google or Microsoft requires my trust towards those big corporations, which sometimes I do not have. Right? 
Um, I, I think the consequence is that mechanism design works in real life. That uh, it, it just depends on trust, right? And the two consequences are that, A, uh, the monopolists who use mechanisms may exploit their trusts. And instead of maximizing social welfare, they maximize surplus and they take that piece of surplus from me. Or, and or, um, I am skeptical of the mechanism designer and I do not tell you the truth. Maybe to my detriment, but I, I don't understand game theory, I can't solve this model. So either way, the mechanism does not work. I am very confident that in financial market where the investment banks are using algorithm to trade with each other, that may, may very well be a re really good application of mechanism design. But I'm, what I'm skeptical is an algorithm versus a million of human beings with flesh and bones. I'm not convinced yet at, the, at this front. Thank you. <laughs> OK, great. So, so first of all, I think it's always good to be skeptical. I encourage you to be skeptical, especially when it comes to my career. <laughs> um, I think I, um, yeah, OK. So um, you are completely right in that uh, we model human beings as being completely rational, which is uh, not always uh, reasonable. Maybe it's always unreasonable, <laughs> but um, uh, a few things about it. First of all, um, I think that it's more reason. So as I mean, we are in the AI era, and we have uh, increasingly more computational agents that work on our behalf. And when we have uh, bots and computers. As, as our agents, and I think we are going to, to a world uh, that is being more and more like this, it's becoming more and more reasonable to make this rationality assumption. So I agree that, I mean, I feel that it's more reasonable to assume that bots would behave rationally than human beings for two reasons. First of all, they have the, com they have the computational power to optimize more than human beings do. And second, because sometimes, I mean, this is also not entirely true, but they have less biases in their decision making. And, uh, and this uh, gets me to the second point, which is everything I said up to now is, you know, the traditional economic game theoretic uh, theory, which completely disregards all the behavioral. Uh, issues and components of our decisions, our behavior, and this is a huge, um, a huge branch in economics, which is called behavioral economics and behavioral uh, uh, models. And I agree that if we want to apply this theory seriously to people, then we also have to consider very seriously all of these, uh, all of this theory of of behavioral issues, biases. Uh, I'm sure you, some of you know that we very recently lost uh, Kahneman, who is together with Tversky, the fathers of, of this theory. Um, and I agree that this is a very crucial part. If we want to integrate this into human beings, then we have to also consider all these uh, biases, and, um, and it is actually happening. So also within our community, there are already people um, that are studying formally, like integrating into the models, all these uh, potential biases and behavioral uh, effects on, on behavior. Do you think that would make consumers trust them? You mean if we take behavioral yeah. uh, if, issues into account? If I believe that, oh, sorry. If I believe that 
corporations out there, I'm, so, I'm sorry for being so skeptical, sorry. Uh, if I believe that corporations out there are purely maximizing profit but not maximizing social welfare, I don't want them to know about human behavior. I want them to stick to whatever algorithm they're doing so that I can bypass it, so that I can install my VPN and stuff like that, right? I think, we, we can, we, oh, as you can see, um, I mean, Kahneman himself, or even Richard Thaler said, um, their theory is for the good of the people, but also that it could be incorporated into you know, uh, dark patterns that discourage consumers from um, having their share of the surplus. Um, I, I, I fear, uh, on one side, I'm also from economics. On one side, I'm happy that behavioral economics is getting widely applied to mechanism design, a very algorithmic, a very computational field. But on the other side, I also fear that that would deteriorate the, the, the consumer trust even more. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh. We need to wrap up. Um, this, I mean, sorry, I mean, so I just say one, there is one online comment, a comment, I think the assumption is that humans are self-interested rather than rational. By the way, we define rationality to be consistently self-interested, so that's um, one of the comments here. And secondly, human will, humans will repeat actions based on successful precedent at least a few times. Also, I think people study that kind of uh, yeah. thing evolutionarily. Yeah. Um, you want to say another final word, or shall we? I mean, yeah, I think we can uh, wrap up. I, I'm, l let me let me just say again, thank you for your question. I think it's all very very important aspects that are not fully covered by by the theory I presented for sure, and um, and I think it's good to end with uh, a lot of uh, skeptical comments. So I'm even happier than it came up in the end. Very good. So thank you very much for everybody.